Okay. Hi everyone. So uh sorry for the delay because we we're waiting for more people to arrive. Uh yeah, this is the talk. I'll be telling teaching the most basics of GDB, uh learning to debug. Uh first something about myself. I'm year two NUS student. I'm majoring in CS and specializing in parallel computing, but I do cybersecurity, so it's kind of kind of weird. Uh, I interned at Starlabs before, which is a cybersecurity company, and I just ended a full-time SWE internship, so I also done SWE. Uh, I do low-level stuff, well, low-level programming, uh, which is what we'll be looking at because it's GDB, uh, because of cybersecurity, because I do binary exploitation, which is basically like hacking EXEs, right, executable files. Uh, yeah, you don't need to be good at 2100 to be able to be good at GDB. So this is my agenda for today. Uh. Uh, first, we go through like a quick prerequisite check, just in case anyone hasn't installed the correct thing. Uh, then I'll go through what is debugging, I'll go through a debugger and the rest of the topics here. <clears throat> so firstly, let's uh, look at the prerequisite check. For those that are on Windows, make sure that you're running either uh, WSL, WSL2, or you're running Ubuntu in a VM. For Mac or Linux, you should be fine. Uh, for Linux, people running Linux, uh, make sure you have GDB. You can just GDB uh, dash dash version, but you should have la, unless you install like Arch Linux or something and didn't configure it. Uh, for Mac, you'll be using LLDB. So now, okay, this is the, the thing, the part where it might get a bit confusing because for those Mac, those of you, if your Mac is on the Intel chip, you'll still be using GDB. But if your Mac is on a uh, ARM64 chip, uh, there'll be some slight differences. Actually, Intel chip can also use LDB, but you will notice that when we start to disassemble the application, your instructions will look different from what I have on my slides because I made this based on the Intel architecture. But the idea should be the same in debugging, so it shouldn't make much difference. Yeah. Uh, personally, I would recommend also, uh, after this, uh, you don't need to do it now, uh, don't use the default GDB because there are a lot of feature, helpful features that's not there in the default GDB. Uh, personally, I use Pwn Debug because I use it to do uh, well binary exploiting, exploitation stuff. There's also GEF. These are both like uh, GDB plugins per se. They give you more functionality within GDB, which is nice to have, I think. Okay, first let's hop into what is debugging. Right, why is debugging is a funny question because I think for many of us CS students, uh, you all are probably familiar, right? Okay, of course, debugging is just the de well, it's removing bugs, right? You find the bugs, you go and defeat the bugs, right? In the high level debugging, high level programming language, debugging comes in, you know, you use exceptions, you use compile errors, you use these to look at what errors you have in your code. Uh, for lower level, uh, it gets a bit worse because when you start to deal with memory directly, you get memory leaks. You can even get BSODs uh, off your buggy program, right? And I know as CS students, or uh, as long as you've done programming, uh, everyone's guilty of this. You just console.log it. You just print line it. You print your all your output. You print a million strings just to see which part of your program it starts to crash. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. I also do that. But uh, the purpose of this is to show you, you know, at, what if you're at a point where it's really the mechanism behind uh, your application, I guess. You know, when you're starting to deal with memory, right? You can't print everything. You, a lot of things also, you can't even read it, even if you print it out, right? So then how do we start to debug our application on the execution level, you know? So uh, I think, this, I thought this was a very good, Diagram. Basically, uh, the key thing to note here is that uh, maybe it's a bit small to see, but y'all should have the slides. Uh, one key thing to note is that after you identify the bug, uh, there's a portion where it says, "Can you reproduce the bug?" I think that is quite important because when you do debugging, effectively you want to understand what is the underlying cause of your bug. Because to really properly debug your application, you don't want to cover over the bug, right? In fact. Uh, you kind of want to defeat the bug at, at the root cause so that it doesn't propagate into further bugs. You know, sp spaghetti coding. Even big corporations are, are quite uh, guilty of this, right? Uh, let's talk about the debugger. 
for the purpose of the talk today, we'll be talking about uh, your GDB and LDB. GB, GDB stands for the GNU debugger, which is for, I believe most of you here from one look. Uh, those that are using the Apple with the new, the M1, M2, M3 chip, you'll be using ARM, you're on the ARM64 architecture, and it comes with the LDB debugger, which is mostly the same as GDB. In fact, it's actually slightly better because the LDB debugger comes with its own set of uh, extra features and like quality of life stuff already. Okay, let's talk about the commands. You don't need to memorize this, okay? You have the slides, you can refer back to it later. But these are the main, I would say the important commands. These are not definitely not all of them, but I would believe that for most of the current requirements for any debugging that you'll do, this should be somewhat enough, right? Uh, to launch the program, you launch GDB on the program, you can set a breakpoint at any location. Location can be function name, li line number, meaning the line number inside your code, the actual line number on your high level IDE. Uh, you can also specify file line number in case it's compiled from multiple files. Uh, you can also specify an address directly, like a memory address. Uh, we'll cover more on memory address in a bit also. Uh, I think one important thing is also the disassemble uh, command because this assemble shows you the machine, like the assembly code that the machine is actually reading, right? The portion of the code that is compiled and placed into your executables text section. That is uh, quite nice when you're doing debugging and you want to set the breakpoint at a specific instruction, which uh, I will also get into uh, in a bit uh, why that's important. Uh, call stack. The call stack, if you didn't know, is basically just the function calls that have been made. Uh, in the purpose of uh, GDB or the demo that I'll be doing, right? Your call stack will just include uh, like printing, print statements, setting. Uh, if there's any function calls, if there's any libc calls, anything, uh, you'll see in the call stack, and you can examine memory. So. Examine memory, okay, what does NFU stand for? Uh, this is also in your slides, in the notes portion. Uh, you can also refer to it. Uh, basically, you, spec you can specify how many units to print, uh, the format that you want to print it in, and also which unit uh, you want to print it in. You can print it in bytes, half words, etc. Right? And uh, format is basically like, you can print it as an integer, or you can print it as a string, etc. Uh, these are instructions for the actual controlling the actual execution uh c is to continue execution n i stands for next instruction so it will step uh next the difference between this is step s i is step so the difference between uh n i s i is that uh when you do next instruction uh when you reach a function call it will not jump out of your current debugging function so for example i'm debugging main it calls uh print right? Your next instruction, it will execute the entire line, the whole print call, then you'll go to the next instruction within main. But if you do SI, when you reaches the print call, it will jump into print and then it will return to your debugger for you. So that is for even more specific stepping. For example, you're calling a lot of functions. You want to figure out, you know, which exactly is the error. It, like, you know, which functions it's uh, crashing at, but you want to see like exactly which part of that function but you don't know where to set the breakpoint in that function. You can just use SI. You will step into that function and then you can step next and next and next. The main idea behind this, right, the debugger is that you can really go down the execution flow one step at a time. So you really see exactly what your system is trying to do at every stage of your application, right? And you, you, you means until. Uh, until is useful when you have a while loop or for loop, you have any loops, right? Uh, for example, you have a, a while loop that loops 10,000 times. You're not going to step next 10,000 times manually, right? How do you reach straight to the end of the loop? You can just call until. Or if you want to just execute until a specific location, but you don't want to set a breakpoint on it, you can also set a location. Same thing, location uh, is the same standard uh, as the same location that you specify above. This is for LDB. Uh, you can see that it's mostly the same. There's some instruction, there's a bit of difference. Actually, I've included a link also. Uh, the slides should be downloaded there. Uh, if you're on uh, M1, M2, entry chip, later when I'm going through the instructions and uh, some instructions, maybe it's not here or it's not in this slide or it doesn't work, uh, please just go to the map 
these two links, just control F and find what is the corresponding because I'll be going through in GDB, not LDB because uh, time constraints as well. Uh. Oh, take the wrong. Okay. Okay. Now is the heavier part of this. Okay, I will try to go through a bit slower for this one. Uh, if there's anything that you're unsure, you can just ask me directly. Just raise your hand, interrupt me, uh, ask me directly. Okay, we'll be talking about program execution, the execution flow of your program. So program execution flow is what happens well, when your program <laughs> executes, right? The system handles assembly instructions and not your high-level code that you're able to read. Assembly instructions are a bit more unreadable. For example, uh, this is the high-level code. Uh, when your compiler uh, compiles it into an executable program for your machine to read, for your OS to read, your OS isn't actually reading in X equals to five. Your OS is actually reading something like this, right? This would be for Intel architecture. It's moving this specific thing called X, uh, moving this five value into this location X, right? That's what this instruction means. You'll see all of this when you start to disassemble your functions in GDB or LDB, but uh, don't need to fear. We, don't, we are not gonna, this is not an assembly course. We're not gonna do a deep dive into assembly instructions. Uh, this is just uh, for you to know, uh, just in case uh, you're confused why it's like a bunch of gibberish you've never seen before, right? Instructions are followed in sequence, uh, meaning uh, if I have, let's say my main function has 20 lines of assembly, it will always execute top, top down. It will go next, 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 until there's, if let's say there's a jump instruction, then it will jump, then it can jump back. But it always goes, flows downwards as a default. So your program, that's why it's called a program execution flow, because it really just top down. Every function it jumps into, it also executes in the exact same direction. There is no reversing of the direction. There's only jumping back or jumping forward. So your program always executes in the same direction. When you read machine code, or if you're interested and you go and see, uh, that is one thing to note, uh, that when you look at the machine code, it always executes top to down. So when you're doing debugging and you want to figure out, you know, uh, which function you want to set a breakpoint at, you want to try to match your high level to your assembly code. This is also one good thing to note. For example, oh, I know that I called this uh, function one, right? You will see a function one call in the code. So you know that everything that comes above that will be code that's executed before. Everything that comes after that is code that executed after. So that line of calling the function will correspond to that line in assembly. And any code below that will also correspond to code below that in assembly. So it's always in the same direction. Okay, yeah? oh, all right. Okay, let's talk about registers. Okay, same thing. Uh, this is just knowledge so that you're able to sort of understand the next part that I'll be going through and the demo that we'll be going through. But you don't need to memorize this. You can always refer to the slide. Uh, Registers are what we call, uh, it's basically like this, think of it like a CPU's fast memory. So your computer has different levels of memory to temporarily store things when your, when your program is running, right? Everyone knows that your computer has RAM, your computer has storage, right? They all have different speed. So RAM is much faster than storage and your registers are your CPU level RAM effectively. You can think of it like that. So it is the fastest, temporary storage, temporary memory that your operating system has. And anytime you execute any program, these registers will always be utilized for intermediary values, for calculations, for passing to functions. Like you can see here, there's uh, all your arguments to functions are also passed through registers, All right? Uh, yeah, this is the LDB uh, equivalent. Uh, sorry, the, uh, the ARM64 equivalent, the Mac equivalent. So if you, this assemble a uh, file that you compile on a, on a Mac with the M1, M2, M3 chip, you will see this, you should see these registers instead, uh, but they could also be slightly different. I'm not actually entirely sure if Apple follows directly the ARM. This is from the ARM uh, instruction, like register, yes? It's slightly different, right? Yep. Uh, sorry, so later on when we are doing the thing, uh, uh, if you, if there's some difference, please uh, sound off also. Then yeah, just help each other out on that. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll go and take a look later during the demo. Ah, okay. 
Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I'll just roughly go through what they mean, lah. So, IPR, R, I don't know why it starts with a R. Uh, some people say it because it's registered. Some people say because it's named after someone, but uh, IP is instruction pointer. Uh, what is the current instruction that your CPU is executing? Is pointed to by the instruction pointer, which corresponds to PC on ARM64. So you'll see that your uh, IP is that register that will keep going down your instruction. You see that the address value in there will just keep going down to the next instruction, next instruction, next instruction. So essentially when you step next instruction, your IP will keep changing to the next instruction. Is what is the current instruction to be executed, basically. Uh, there's a return value is stored in REX for Intel, uh, and it's stored in R0 for ARM. Uh, frame pointer and stack pointer, I will go through what is the what is a stack, but frame and stack are basically the same thing. It's just one is specific to your function, one is for just the what the general uh stack is for your application. Your frame pointer is used to save uh temporary locations. You don't need to actually know that. That's fine. Today we'll only be focusing on stack pointer. Yeah, that's the ARM um, equivalent. Okay, uh the link should be in your slides also. Please uh over my next few slides, uh, just go ahead and download or clone this onto your repo. It's a public repo. Uh, there'll be three demo files in there. You'll need to compile it yourself on your system, just in case, because I cannot compile for you, just in case it can't run. Uh, yeah, just do it over the... Yeah, I'll just give you all like two, three minutes to download it. Yeah. Should be fine. Sorry, which one? Yes, just use GCC. Uh, yeah, I'll be going through also during the demo. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's look at demo one dot C first. So I'll do a basically a direct step by step walkthrough on a basic debugging flow. Uh, but this is a very simple application. Uh, this is the all the code that's in there. It's just ten lines. Uh, basically what this code does. Uh, anyone wants to. Answer. Do you all know what this code does? Should be quite simple. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. So it just asks for your name and then it just prints it back out to you. Uh yeah, that's all it does. Uh what we'll be trying to aim to do is to find our user input within the debugger. Okay, so yeah. First uh compile it, just use GCC. Uh GCC and then you run it. One, when you run it, yeah, that's exactly what it does. What is your name? You have an input, and then it says hello, and then whatever input you have. It should be the same for everyone. Now let's, uh, once you run it, it works. Yes. That's already Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, just, you can compile your own. Just compile your own. If it runs, then you can run it directly. If it doesn't run, then just compile your own. Because mine is compiled on Ubuntu. Yeah. So we run the debugger of it. Uh, for this, because I'm on Ubuntu, I run GDB demo one. If you're on Mac, you can run LDB demo one. It should launch up your debugger and attach it to an instance of the. Sorry. E so. Yeah, uh, yes, I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, just, uh, you can just recompile it because the, there might be some different, the, I don't think there'll be much differences. The main differences are usually the security patches. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, it should be the same. The C that I'm using uh is just the the default C library that comes with the twenty two point oh four libc, and then uh yeah, then it has the C eighty nine annotations. Yeah, the is a standard lah. Right. after you run a debugger, uh, you can disassemble the main function. So this is the instruction for GDB. Or uh, LDB, you can find the equivalent. It's just disassemble dash dash name and then main. All right, you'll see something like this. This is Intel. All right. Okay, I'm gonna move on. If you have any more troubles later during the hands-on portion, you can revisit this also. Yep. Okay. So we want to look at where the user in we want to find the user input, right? That's our our main goal. So let's find the portion of the code within the assembly that we are interested in. So for this, for this specific uh for my specific one, right? You can see that there's a portion of the code that calls read. Uh, read is how we get the user input, right? So where should you break point if you want to find what happens right after the read? Well, you just break point in the instruction right after it, right? So over here, read is called in plus 59, name plus 59. So let's break point at the very next instruction because when you break point an instruction, it, it stops the execution, it pauses the execution when you reach it. It doesn't execute the instruction. So let's pause, let's uh break point over here. Uh, this is doable on LDB also. You can also just break point at that specific line of code. Uh, if you look at the source code, just break point at the line of code right after the read. It should also break point at similarly. Right. This will set a break point there, and then now we can run the code. Type R or type run. It should run the code again. So now your application will actually be running within the debugger. Same thing, it will show whatever the application is supposed to print, right? It asks for your name. And then once you input your name, it should hit the breakpoint. If you set the breakpoint correctly. Case you need to see, you need to find the correct line of assembly, the instruction right after the call. If you can't find it in the assembly on ARM, uh, it could be because it doesn't load the symbol name and it loads the address of the function directly. So if you can't find it within here, you can just break at the line of code instead instead of breaking directly on the assembly instruction. Yep. Oh yeah, like you mean this or this? This one, this one. Oh, this is just uh, because your assembly instructions, each instruction has varying sizes and they are all from an offset from the start of the function. So this is just the, the offset of that specific instruction from the start of that function. Yeah. So when you do this, your debugger sort of knows. That's why you see the offset is actually different. Like the space between the offset is different, right? You see that this is plus 54, uh, plus 59, 64. These are all five bytes apart, but 68 is only four apart from this because the size of the instruction is different. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, okay. Once we hit the breakpoint, now we are back at our main task, right? We want to find the user input. Where do you think the user input is stored? For those that know low-level 
programming or know uh, like a program, uh, the memory frame, then you probably know where to find it already. Uh, for those that don't, where do you think that is stored? Where is our temporary user input stored? Okay, and that is what I will go through next. All right, so, okay, uh, a bit of, quite a lot of information on this slide. Uh, don't worry if you can't memorize it, same thing. Uh, you can just refer back to it. This is what a, an example of what the uh, program memory will look like during execution. Right. Sometimes you, when you see online, the diagram could be flipped. It could be, uh, actually a lot of them will be flipped the other way around. The stack will be above growing downwards. But uh, the idea is the same. The layout is, should be like that. Uh, where the main idea is there's a portion where your code is stored. So all your assembly, your compiled assembly instructions are all in that section. And then next to it will be sections for static variables. Right, both initialized and uninitialized static variables should all be stored uh, next to each other. They are in separate sections, but they are all in this one uh, data segment. Right, right below that will be your heap. So we call it a heap uh, because, I, okay, actually we only call it the heap because the thing sort of, uh, it's not like a, it's not, okay, the stack, sorry, let me just go to a stack. But the stack is a last in, first out. Thing. That's why we call it a stack, because when you stack something on top, the first thing and the only thing you can take out is the thing on top. So whatever goes in last will be the first to come out. Heap does not work that way. Heap is sort of more, I guess, uh, when you allocate memory specifically for your variable, you'll be placed in a heap. For those that haven't done low-level programming before, uh, this might be a, a, like a foreign concept, but uh, don't worry about that because we won't be touching the heap today. The heap is another can of worms. Uh, today, we'll just be looking at the stack because this is where all your temporary variables are stored. In the case of our code, right, our user input will end up here right after the read because it is read into our input variable and it will be placed on the stack because it's a it's a... It's not a global variable, it's not a static variable, and it's, there's no memory specifically alloc allocated for it, right? So it will be on the stack. So now we look, right? In this structure, right after read, the, on the instruction right after read, our user input will be there, right? So what, what exactly is this place, right? How, what, what does this mean? I, I can, you can see in the diagram, what does it mean practically in your debugger? Right. Remember what we talked about earlier? There was the stack pointer, correct? So the stack pointer actually points to the top of your stack. So your stack pointer will constantly change as more things get added to the stack. So it's sort of like a, it's a last in first out list, uh, right? So as more things get added to a stack, the stack pointer will move. When it gets removed, the stack pointer moves again. When you go into another function, your stack pointer moves again because different functions have their own uh, like reserved stack space for the functions all the functions temporary variable needs, right? All will be stored there. So now we know it's stored at the top of the stack, your user input, right? And we know there's this one thing that your CPU keeps track of that points to the top of the stack, right? It points right here. So now theoretically speaking, if we look at this graph, right? All we need to do is at the point of execution right after the read, we, we stop the, we pause the execution there. And then if we look at the stack pointer, which is now pointing right at the top of the stack, we should theoretically see our user input. All right, but this is just theory. Let's try it out physically, right? Uh, so you can see it reaches the breakpoint after I input my name. This is the instruction right after. At this point, if I examine the stack pointer, this is how you examine a pointer. You use the dollar sign. And S is the format specifier for string. So if I examine what is currently at my stack pointer as a string, you will see this is where my input is. Hello, new line, because I pressed enter. Yep. So if you press and uh, you'll see uh, in C, in C++, when you get user input, uh, there will always be a new line or a null byte at the end of your string because it terminates your string. 
So when you submit your input with an enter, then you'll always see a new line at the end of your string. And there we go. We found the user input, right? Well, very simple demo. Uh, this is just a step-by-step. -step. Now, after this, y'all can try this out a bit. Uh, we'll just do a short break. Uh, you can go through the slides and then I'll start going through the hands-on demo after this. This will be quite heavy also. So please take a break, take some time, rethink about the concepts, absorb it a little bit more. Uh, demo two will be a bit harder than this. Okay, uh, let's move on to the hands-on demo portion. Uh, sorry guys, come. Uh, for this portion, I'll be providing you all a very long time for this. Uh, so you can revisit your demo one if, it's still, if you still can't get it to work. Uh, me included and all the uh, hackers team members will be working around to help you all out uh, directly with uh the debugging stuff, if you still have any questions, feel free to ask us directly. Uh, for the hands-on demo, the what our goal, final goal is for this part, is to be able to debug demo2.c. So if you open up demo2.c, uh, what does this program do? What, what is the difference between demo2.c and demo1.c? Right, Demo1 and demo2 both prints the user's name input back out. It both does hello and then your name, right? But what is the biggest difference in demo two? Yeah, it calls a function. It doesn't call the print directly. Of course, uh, if we talk about programming wise, this is, uh, this is not good to do, but uh, just for the purpose of seeing how arguments are passed to functions, uh, we'll be looking at uh, demo two with a simple function call with one variable, which is one argument which is your username input, right? Yeah, so how do we check variables pass to a function now? Same question, same style of question from before, right? If we recall from earlier, right? Uh, there are also registers that is just specifically for passing arguments, right? So if we look in Intel, uh, in uh, x86-64 or in x86, it is passed through the DI, RDI or EDI. Uh, for ARM, it's passed through R0 through R7. And actually in ARM, uh, R0 also doubles up as a uh, register to store the return variable from a function. Uh, so yeah, but it's also used to pass the first argument. Uh, yes. Okay, now this is the portion where using the knowledge from demo one, Try yourself, see if you can get to get your debugger to print the hello, pass through the correct register to your function. Uh, now we'll just be walking around to help you all out. Uh, this is free time for the next 40, 45 minutes. Feel free to play around. Feel free to revisit your part one as well. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, I believe most people should be done with at least the demo two file. So now what I'll be doing is I'll just do like a live demo. Uh, I will go through demo two on my computer. I'll stream it up. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so demo two, is this big enough? Actually, wait, let me increase it a bit more. Okay, so we have, first let's uh, recompile uh, demo two, <laughs> right? And we run demo two. So uh, it does the same thing as demo one, right? Uh, I can put whatever name, it will reprint it out for me, right? Let's go into GDB and go into demo two. Okay. <clears throat> Right, it has loaded my uh, demo2 file. Uh, <clears throat> from here, let's disassemble the main function. And then we want to find the point where it calls the function, right? Because what we want to find is our user input 
in the RDI register. And the RDI register is the first argument that is passed to any function, right? So on the function call instruction, right before the function is called, everything must be put in place first, right? That's how function calls are done uh, at the lowest level, where all the variables or all the required stuff is placed in their positions, and then the call will go up, right? So we want to see what is the state of the program uh, right at the moment where I'm ready to call print name, which is the function that we are targeting, right? We can see that it's on, uh, okay. it's on line 70 plus 70, it's on offset 71, right? Right, we set a breakpoint at line 71. <clears throat> and then we run the application. So same thing, you'll ask for our name. And then we'll run it. It hits the breakpoint. Oh, why is my GDB like that? Okay, yeah, it hits the breakpoint. Uh, now, by right, if I have stopped it at the correct place, if I read the RDI, if I examine the RDI register, I will see that the argument has been prepped and placed inside RDI for the function call, right? If I just examine RDI like that, you see that it's like a, it's, it's some bytes, right? Uh, to format it, same thing. You X slash, S is the format specifier for string. So if I do X slash S RDI, you see that that is my input there. Uh, in cases where, let's say you're not dealing with text, right? You're dealing with bytes directly. You can also print bytes. You can print more bytes. For example, instead of just printing, if I just X RDI, it just prints, uh, oh, now it's, it saves the last state, right? <clears throat> if I just print one byte, for example, X slash X, right? It will end up just printing 0 x 74, right? I can increase the amount. Let's say I want to print uh, the first 16 that is starting from RDI, right? I can just put X slash 16 X. X specifies that I want to print it as a hex, right? There, now you will print 16 bytes from the start, which I specify is RDI. And you can see that after RDI, right, 7465, these, are, these actually correspond to the ASCII code for the text. <clears throat> after this, it's just 0x00, because there's nothing else that you need to be passed into the function, All right? Uh, this is just to, to play around with the formatting. You can even uh, print more than one string. This will try to print two strings from the start address, which is RDI. So you try to print two strings starting from RDI. The first string it prints, when it tries to print a string, right? What it's doing behind the scenes is it will print out your bytes as ASCII characters until it reaches a terminator. What we call a terminator in this case will be a null byte, 0x00, or a new line, right? So in this case, uh, 0x0a is, uh, so it reaches the new line and then it terminates the first string. I try to print a second string, it will print the next thing that is right after this new line, which actually we can see is the 0x00 here. But 0x00 is a terminator in itself. So it terminates the string before the string even can build anything. That's why you can see that the second string that we print is, uh, is just nothing like that, right? If let's say, <clears throat> Right, we want to, let's say we modify this. So now our print name can take two things, right? Let's say uh, it's another string that is just a H, for example, right? And then, <laughs> and then we print the H as well, right? Right, and then we pass both variables into our function. <clears throat> Compile it. Right, 
now it will ask for two things, right? What is your name? Let's say uh, my name is Etienne. What is your age? Uh, let's put 22, right? Yep. You can see that this weird thing happens here, right? This is actually because, uh, like I said, our terminator in this case is a new line, right? When I'm printing the input directly, it prints. Remember how up here, we saw that our input is whatever we input plus a new line at the back. So that's the funny thing. When you are printing, when you're trying to print a string directly, same thing what your code will try to do is you'll try to interpret your input as a string. So it will reach the new line and then it will print until the new line, then it stops after that. So that's why when I print both my name and my age, right, and I don't actually strip the new line and replace it with a now, now byte, for example, right, what happens is that it also prints that new line as part of the string. So you'll see that this is actually behind the scenes, this is E10 new line, and this is 22 new line. Uh, we'll also try to check it out in GDB. Same, uh, same thing. Uh, we disassemble the main function, and then we see that <laughs> behind read, right? This time it's on 65. That is our first read. And we, this time around, we have a second read, right? So first read is 65. Second read is here on 102. So that is our two reads. So if you want to see the variables that's passed, that uh, the variable that's put on the stack first, right? Let's see, right? Will be placed at these two reads. So uh, we can break point at both of these. And then we also break point at the moment where the function is called, because we want to see both of these variables, both of these arguments being passed to the function, right? So the first one that we break point at is right after the first read, plus 70. And then we break point at the second one, right? which is at the second read. So right after the second read, so plus 107. And then we break point a third time. We break point on the print name instruction. We don't want it to execute. We want to stop right there and see what are the things being passed into it. So let's break point at uh, 124. And we run this application. So the first break point should trigger once I input my first input because uh, that's where I set it, right? So let, let me put, okay, same thing. At this point, this our our this input should be put at the very top of the stack because it's a last in first out list. As more and more variables get added to it, it will get added to the top of your stack. Your stack pointer will keep incrementing or uh, uh yes, to reach the top of the the new top of the stack, so called. Right? So same thing if we if we print the stack pointer, you can see that it's over here. If let's say I print four strings, uh you'll see that okay, these are just uh like jumbo up stuff. It's other, it's not relevant, right? You can see that it's all gibberish or it's empty, right? Now let's continue, right? Remember the command for continue is C. Now it asks for my age, right? Let's say I put 22. It will reach another breakpoint. Same thing at this point, if we check the stack, right? Now, now that's the thing, right? You see that it's still test because when we defined our two input variables, we defined it at the start and we defined both as a size 100 char array. What happens is that your application will first give it sort of reserve sort of a space for it on the stack. And as you put more variables in, as you fill these variables up with your code, it will push it into these locations, right? So now if we actually print, <clears throat> this should work. Oh, that's weird. Okay, that's weird. Uh, okay, I'll I'll come back to this later. Let me let me move on to the next part first. <clears throat> okay, yeah, immediately it hits the next breakpoint. There's no more user inputs left to give. Uh. This breakpoint should be right at the function call, right? So uh, same thing, you can just refer back to the slides if you need to, right? First argument, second argument, right? RDI, RSI for my test, 22. 
So you can see that your integer arguments is actually placed at the correct place right before the thing. The stack thing, I'll, I'll go back to it later. I'll go and debug on my own. But <clears throat> yes, so we see that there are two. Yeah, we can print both. You can print them as bytes as well, right? Uh, let's just do it like, uh, yeah, let's just print x10. Same thing, this will be the same bytes that you saw earlier. It's just T E S T new line, right? Same thing with this. You can also print this as hex. It's also just uh this one will be two two new line. So you see the zero x zero a at the end. That is one of the terminators. So when you print and it reaches the zero x zero a, it will stop. Let's see does this. Yeah. So it's stored at different locations. You can see that uh if you look at the address of RDI and RSI. RSI is placed uh, 0x1, uh, 0x010, 0x10, which is 16 uh, bytes after uh, the RDI. If I do, oh, it doesn't even reach. Oh, okay, it's it's very far, but yeah, but if the idea is that <clears throat> right, uh if you look at 290, if you remember this is the memory address, right? The RDI is at this address, 290, its test is placed there, right? So if we view the bytes at RDI, you'll see that it's here, we can find it. And actually if you print enough bytes, like let's say I'm printing 500 bytes from RDI, and it reaches 300, which is the address for RSI. As we saw earlier, when we print RSI, it's at uh, FE 300, right? This is where our these bytes are. So if you print 500 bytes from the start, from the start being RDI, and you reach the 0x 300 line, you actually see that your RSI value is there as well. Yeah, so it, uh, that is the basically, in this case, that is the size that is allocated uh, for the RDI and the RSI uh, on your stack. These are actually all uh, on your stack also. Uh, it's just offset with quite a large difference so that you're able to have a very large variable uh, there. So it doesn't, it doesn't override each other. <clears throat> and actually on this note, uh, we can keep looking, we can continue to look at uh, the next The next one, uh, this one will just be, right? <clears throat> Let me change my zoom. Okay, right. So building onto this, you can see that in the debugger, you can actually play around quite a lot with it. <clears throat> you actually should be able to find everything that you put into the program in the debugger. In the case where you allocate memory specifically for it, right, you'll find it in a heap instead. So there is a whole other can of worms. If you're interested in the heap, uh, there are readings on it that you can do. And I do write about it on my blog also. If you're interested, just an intro. And if you look at demo 3.c, right, there's an interesting part in the code. It looks exactly like demo 1. But what is the difference here? It's a, it's a pretty minor difference. Are you able to spot it? If you just swap between the two files. All right. You can see that I have defined the size of my input differently here. So in my previous application, if you saw in demo 1, in demo 2, I define input as a 16 byte, uh, size of 16 bytes. Right, and I imp uh, sorry, I defined it as a size of hundred bytes, and I read hundred bytes into it, which is the I mean that makes sense, and actually that's the funny thing also, these days your compiler is quite tough. If you try to compile this app, it will still compile, but it will actually issue you a warning, and if you try to compile, the warning should be something along the lines of, uh, the read is reading more bytes than it's than your input is specified, right? So it basically warns you that there's this thing called a buffer overflow. So remember our earlier 
program, like the program diagram here, <clears throat> right? If you look at this, in the case of this, your stack goes upwards. So when you put your input in, right, your input will fill up like this. <clears throat> and your, when your input starts filling up like this, if you can input more than uh, you're supposed to, right, it starts to flow. It starts to overflow its boundary and go into other parts of the stack. So this is a very, very simplified diagram. Uh, actually, in the stack, a lot of your execution flow things are stored there temporarily, right? So if we look at uh, the earlier pointers that the registers that exist, right? There's all these registers there. And your instruction pointer is actually placed on the stack as well. For when you call a specific function or when you're exiting a specific function and it calls the red instruction, right? It will actually return to whatever is at the top of your stack. So now if you think about it, what if I have an application that takes in more bytes than it's supposed to accept? And I overflow and I start to overwrite all these different registers, right? In this case, what if I start to overwrite the stack pointer, the frame pointer? What if I start to overwrite integer arguments? What if I start to overwrite the instruction pointer, right? What happens? if we read more characters into our variable, into our buffer, then what it can hold. That's for you to find out. So actually for that, I reached the end of the course. I hope it hasn't been too confusing. Uh, just a quick afterward, right? It will always be easier to see exactly what's wrong with your program when you use a debugger, because print statements has their limits. You cannot print memory directly. You cannot print things that are not printable. I mean, obviously, right? So in cases where you're allocating a lot of memory or you're splitting a lot of processes, right? And your print statements don't actually show you exactly what's wrong. You only know the point where your application crashes, right? That's not enough to help you debug because there's not enough to help you find out exactly what's wrong with your program. So at that point, you will need to consult your debugger. You will need to set your breakpoints because it's much more specific than prints, right? You, you saw that just now in between my print, the print call and the read call, even though in my code, the two lines are right next to each other. But in, in the assembly code, right, there's so much like instructions in between them because that is what your OS is actually doing under the hood to carry out all these uh, you know, different function calls to move the correct values into the correct place, right? Of course, don't give up. Debugging takes a lot of practice, right? I mean, even I make errors, right? Even though I've been debugging for so long. So it, it really just requires you to you know, jump in, you compile your own thing, uh, just play around with it like what I did, right? I changed the function from taking one variable to taking two variables. Then I try to find both variables since I know which register they have to be in. That's also one thing I find so magical about when we look at low level, when we look at low level debugging, when we look at, you know, assembly execution, everything is determ everything is very determinant. When you look at it theory wise, when you read, when you know the theory on, you know, where these values are placed, where these value, how these values are passed into certain functions, how certain functions are called, right? They always will apply physically, no matter what your theory always will apply into practice, right? Perhaps there are some uh, underlying things. Maybe there are some new security mitigations. They insert in random bytes in between, or maybe they place, you know, other things on the stack that is not part of your uh, defined variables, etc. right? But other than that, when you can control certain parts of the stack, you always control that part of the stack. When you are moving something into RDI, you're always moving it into RDI. The system will never call a function with the first argument not being in RDI, unless there's some underlying thing in the language itself, right? For example, when you when you use Python, right? When you C++, now that's slightly different, right? For example, Python will take in a pointer to itself. The function will take in a, a instance of itself as the first argument, something like that, right? But when you look at direct low-level programming like C, everything is very determinant. So what you 
understand in theory what you write out on paper you can always find it within the debugger by itself you are really just dissecting you know the way that a computer is executing the instructions dissecting how instructions are really carried out on the os level right and for most uh languages nowadays visual debugger exists so what i just showed you is a command line debugger right the gnu debugger uh is like it's been here for very very long but if you are let's say you're coding in you know let's talk about more practical scenario i'm coding in java i'm coding in javascript right for all i'm coding in c plus plus right i have a windows application that i just compiled right for example if it's a windows executable i can use win debug to debug it so it provides all the features that i just showed you in uh gdb but it comes with a visual interface it comes with you know different windows it comes with its own set of extra quality of life features right and actually one very interesting thing is that for windows debugger there's even something they call the time travel debugging so as you're executing the, the application it actually saves the state of the application throughout the execution so you can travel back in time of the execution and forward in time and back in time to just you know look at okay let's say i just i passed this instruction did i miss something let me go back and check you can actually so-called you know travel back in time to the previous state of the application to go and check everything so that's why i find well i think everything is very interesting you know like for java you can set breakpoints within the id if you're let's say you're using intellij right intellij actually lets you set a breakpoint by just clicking at the side of your line and then you'll see like a small circle there that means that a breakpoint has been set there if you run the code through intellij when it reaches that point of the code it will actually break for you and then same thing you can do all the different debugger stuff right you just need to search up different debuggers have different features have different ways of using it yeah so like i mentioned this is my blog and that's my link tree uh if you are in case you're interested on my blog actually i mainly write about security stuff but uh because i do binary uh most of my security posts are also on well low level exploitation right so if you're interested especially you know the the further exploitation that i just went through if you're interested you know how hackers use that to gain control of a system to hijack your execution flow right to make your program execute into somewhere that the program doesn't actually execute into normally right if you're interested to find out all that i do have write-ups on my blog also here and there you can scroll all the way to the bottom there are all these basic challenges uh sort of like ctf challenges that cover this also which i find very interesting yeah uh regarding the just now that uh debugging demo if you have any questions i'll debug a bit uh, if you have any question if you're more interested to find out more just you can just feel free to come to the front but if not uh that's actually the end of my presentation thank you for listening thank you for sticking with me through i know it's like if you've never seen this before it's a very heavy topic to absorb there's a lot of knowledge in here there's a lot of things to to get used to but thank you for sticking with me to the end yeah thank you <laughs>